Uh, so I'm pleased to introduce to you today Nitsan Bengal. Dr. Bengal is currently working as a data science specialist in the Health Information Systems Division at 3M right here in Minneapolis. She earned a PhD in applied math from Brown University, uh, then held positions at several research institutes, the Weizmann Institute of Science here at IMA and at the Free University of Berlin. I wasn't willing to brave the German there, apologies. <laughs> Her research has involved nonlinear dynamics and analysis on fractal spaces. And in her current role, um, she's worked on a wide range of projects from chem chemical analytics to traffic solutions. Lately, she's been working on math heavy machine learning projects involving health and health data. She currently serves as Math Alliance Director for Industrial Relations, helping to increase the diversity of the quantitative workforce. She's also a mentor for the AWM Mentor Network and is a founding organizer for the 3M RISE Symposium that introduces STEM graduate students from marginalized groups to R&D opportunities in industry. Today, Dr. Bengal will talk to us about from equation to innovation, making an impact with math beyond academia. But join me in welcoming her. Thank you all very much for giving me this opportunity to speak. Thanks so much to the AWM for giving me this wonderful opportunity to address so many mathematicians and share my own personal experience. Um, so first step that we always have to go with is making legal happy. The opinions expressed herein are solely my own and do not express the views or opinions of my employer or the companies mentioned in this presentation. We got a butt cover. So my career plan, I've known for most of my life that I really truly wanted to do math, but what this actually meant was kind of up in the air. I was a kid and I knew I wanted to have success and career satisfaction, and it would involve sitting at a desk and solving math problems. Well, that can look like a lot of different things. When I was in middle school, I thought I would run my own fashion business. In ninth grade, I was going to go into high finance and be a businesswoman. By the end of high school, once I finally got to take physics classes, I was going to be a mathematician or physicist like Sally Ride. For about a month, I thought maybe actuary or statistician. Um, the work that the uh, actuaries here do is very, very impressive and difficult and not quite up my alley. For the rest of my life, I knew I wanted to be an applied mathematician. That picture was actually taken uh, just a few buildings away at the IMA at the beginning of my postdoc. But being an applied mathematician can also take a lot of different forms. I did a short detour thinking I would go into academia. Um, like many of you, I had many graduate advisors tell me the only path forward was academia. And for a while, I bought into that. And then I realized, actually, very much thanks to the words of Catherine Leonard, uh, that for me personally, that wasn't true. So in 2014, I left academia and joined 3M. So for the last eight years, I've been a mathematician at a materials company. Now, most of you have used 3M materials quite extensively and not thought any math goes into them. I mean, what kind of math is involved in post-it notes or respirators? Well, 3M likes to think of itself as a science company. They're in practically every industry that exists, and they have a vision of using technology to advance every company, developing products that enhance every home, and creating innovation that improves every life. What this means is that really every kind of thing you can imagine developing, 3M probably interacts with and has a product related to it in some way. So this opens up a lot of avenues of science. Being an originally materials company, they love their chemistry, so they have their periodic table of science and technology. So this is the current up-to-date version of it. Um, and you can see all of the different wide variety of fields people are working in, from radiation processing to display components to dental and orthodontic materials. 
but what does this mean for a mathematician? What can I do in industry? Well, I can clear the air with filtered smart filters. I can improve people's health and appearance with Clarity Clear Tray aligners. I can improve the ease and the accuracy of security procedures with the Thales Cogent contactless fingerprint scanner that, if any of you came internationally, might have stuck your hands in. I can analyze chemical properties with diffusion-ordered spectroscopy, protect workers with smart lock self-attracting lifelines, save time and improve brainstorming with those post-its, uh, distinguish people's preferences even among things that don't yet exist, develop new materials, and of course, it is industry, sell more products. These are all things I've actually personally worked on. So what can a mathematician do with math and industry? We can make an impact. Thinking that the only element of science and technology that I can play in is math is underestimating the huge breadth of impact that math can have. Math impacts every area of science. It just may be further removed from the theoretical. And if you try, you can really find every possible connection. So being a mathematician in industry, I have done a lot of science and learned a lot of lessons, and I want to share a few of those with you today. The first lesson is that your math background can be valuable and impactful right out of the gate. You might be thinking, if you're considering industry at all, or considering um, helping your students who might be interested in that path to go down it, that they're going to need to become a computer scientist. They're going to need to stop doing math and start doing machine learning and never look back. And that's not accurate. Their math background might be useful on day one. So one example of this for me was in the space of air quality. I was brought into a project for the Filtreat Smart app. They were looking to do data-driven product replacement. So our construction and home um, improvement market division makes Filtreat Smart filters, the thing, or oh, makes Filtreat filters, the things that go in your furnace in your home. And their marketers did tests and discovered most people don't change them at the right cadence. Sometimes they don't change them often enough and they get clogged and they're not clearing the air in their home well, but sometimes they change it way too often. They're spending quite a bit more than they actually need to, and that's a problem too. We figure if we can help you figure out when to change your furnace filters at the right time, save you money if you're spending it too often, get better um, use out of your product if you're changing it too infrequently, you might keep buying it from us. So they wanted us to come up with an app that would actually tell you personally when your furnace filter needed to be replaced. And so we did in work with the material scientists as well, myself and another data scientist who was a mechanical engineer graduate from the University of Minnesota. We developed um, an HVAC state algorithm. So we were able to create our own sensors, deploy them to test users around the country, get weather data going back years for every single zip code in America, uh, and actually do data science using a wide variety of um, mathematical techniques and using even Simulink uh, for thermal modeling software to develop the Filtry 365 algorithm, which can actually predict with less than 1% bias when furnace filters run out of life. Uh, to give you an idea, before that, people were changing them about 75% off of the real run out of lifetime. So this problem had a lot of really interesting technology development and quite a lot of challenges. So it involved multimodal data fusion. We're getting data from the National Weather Service. We're getting data from physical sensors on devices. We're getting data from our custom uh, multi-sensors that we sent to our test users. And we need multimodal algorithms to intelligently combine all of this disparate data. We dug very deeply into time series analytics and into thermal modeling in order to come up with the best algorithms to do so. But there is a great deal of variance in the data and that makes it much harder to get high accuracy because of the signal to noise ratio. And large scale temporal data 
is very rarely well labeled. So that was also a big problem for us. So this wasn't some easy problem. There were real challenges and real technical development to make, and it utilized my math background right away. Another major lesson that I think is important is that you may be asked to learn and use a completely different area of mathematics from your expertise. Don't be anxious about it. Take it as a fun opportunity. And remember, they're not expecting you to be an expert in all math. They're expecting you to be an expert in teaching yourself math. So where this came into play for me was in digital orthodontics. Those of you who have ever used them might recognize that as a clear tray aligner. So 3M has been in the space of braces and lingual brackets and teeth cleaning for many decades, but in the past decade we've entered into clear tray aligners so that we could really cover the entire breadth of how you fix your teeth. Well, they came to my AI group um, looking for algorithms and software to do automated treatment planning. When you go into your orthodontist, and you say, I want clear tray aligners. The old way of doing that was they would put goop that expands in your mouth, and 3M made that goop, um, create a mold, send the mold to a company where they would scan it and then literally chop it up into individual teeth, move the teeth around on little bars to design the stages, send that plan back to the doctor, who would make his comments and send it back, and tweaks would be made and back and forth and back and forth. That's a really slow process. Instead, what we wanted to do was use an intraoral dental scanner. So get your 3D data, skip all of the physical objects, and automate the vast majority of the treatment planning process so that our technicians, instead of spending hours and hours on each uh, patient's data and waiting for revision after revision from the doctor, could run our algorithm, get a near perfect treatment plan in a short amount of time, tweak it to perfection, send it to the doctor, and not even have any revisions. So this required me to teach myself computational geometry, mesh processing, a long time uh, reminder of geometric algebras that I hadn't even thought about since sophomore year of undergrad, geometric deep learning in order to create this healthcare solution. So these are actually real results on a real patient scan. Okay, it's not wanting to play. That's a little disappointing. Okay, uh, that should be moving. I uh, imagine it was. Um, <laughs> uh, so what was going to happen was you were going to get to see our algorithms at play actually moving the teeth. So that's a real patient scan completely de-identified. And you would see how our automated treatment planning algorithms would move the teeth in individual stages to a final uh, optimal alignment. You are seeing that in the front view and top view at the bottom for another patient. So there was a great deal of optimization, geometric deep learning, computational geometry, because we're just getting a list of mesh vertices. That's the mouth that we're getting to deal with. And this is a product that's been on the market now since 2018. So I was able to, oh, now it moves. Okay, there you go. Um, so you can see getting to nicely aligned teeth from the state they were in originally. Um, so we were able to develop a lot of really cool technologies with a lot of very heavy math in them, including robotic path planning algorithms, which come from uh, algebraic topology very heavily and geometric algebras to impose real world constraints from biokinetics on moving the teeth in natural motions. You know, I can't just say, I want to move your molar this many millimeters and <laughs> no problems involved. We actually got to do what your body can handle. We had to develop new to the world mesh processing toolboxes to accelerate our 3D machine learning. We had incredibly noisy data. I mean, you're dealing with micron level um, uh, shape and texture on your teeth, and it's all very important. And dealing with the noise of uh, those teeth scans really brought that age old problem to bear for us. 
And also with a limited number of clinical cases to start, I believe we had only 100 at the beginning, algorithms had to operate in a high dimensional and low sample regime, made it very tricky and really impacted what kind of technology we could develop. So another important lesson for me was to seek out familiar terms and ideas in other fields, things I recognized from my math experience, and not be afraid to be out of your depth. So for me, this was the word diffusion. I did my PhD on diffusion equations, so when I see that word in another field, I start talking to the people there. And this led to me developing something that has allowed me to improve fundamental science, specifically in the space of applied chem and chem engineering that is an NMR spectroscopy device. I have been working since 2015 in the space of Fred Home integration and spectroscopy, which is actually an area with a ton of mathematical research, just usually published in chemistry journals. Um, and so I can't go into a lot of detail about what this is involved, but utilizing advanced math to extract molecular weight distributions from NMR spectroscopy signals, and doing PDE inverse problems, statistical signal processing methods, et cetera, in order to solve an ill-posed inverse problem coming from spectroscopy. Now, one of the really tricky things in working in this area has been that the techniques that I'm developing, creating the molecular weight distributions, are specifically useful for materials where we don't have any other tests that can give us that. They're too sticky or their um, distributions are in too high a range. So I can't just check my answer at the back of the book. I don't have another test that can say, why, well, yes, your math was correct here, or no, your math was wrong. It's really a wide open space. And it was intimidating, but I worked with my chemist colleagues and we found a way to really do the science and be certain of it. Uh, my, the first iteration of this technology was deployed internally in 2017 and has been used on dozens of products every year since then. Another good lesson is to look for the non-mathematicians who are doing math around you. For example, in one of my first weeks at 3M, someone who was working on our Post-it Plus app came to me and asked me to do a geometry proof. I truly never thought I would actually have to write a proof in industry. I mean, who would have guessed? But he was working on algorithms to merge the physical and digital to allow brainstorming sessions with Post-its to be captured on your phone, cataloged, extracted, cleaned up, and turned into a digital file that you can send around. And he had a feature that he knew would be really useful here, but it would only be true if there was a certain property of the angles of the captured post-it, no matter what angle he took the picture at. So he needed a geometry proof. So geometry proofs actually supporting advanced computer vision. I met a neuroscientist and cognitive psychologist who was working on our 3M display quality score. So she was actually developing a mathematical equation to quantify how good a display looks to people, whether it exists in real life or not. This is why someone with a background in perception science is so critical in these spaces, because we actually make a ton of materials that go into displays of all kinds. There are 33M materials in this laptop right here and in pretty much every smart device you guys are carrying. And we have a lot of films that increase luminance and change the color gamut. So we work with all of these companies that make displays, TVs, computers, and if they want to make a display that looks better than last year's model, because they want people to spend money on it, but uses less battery life, they need to know how to get that trade off and not impact the um, quality of the vision. They need to know if it's worth it to dig into 8K TVs or if the human eye actually can't tell it apart. Hint, it can't tell it apart. <laughs> um, and so it was really fascinating for me to learn how she converted all of this experimental data with humans and perception science into a single mathematical equation. 
I worked with computer scientists who were working on our smart science problem. So a lot of our cars now have camera systems in there and we wanna make them smarter. We wanna make them better at driving. And one of the ideas we had was since 3M makes most of the traffic signs on the road, can we actually put something in there that doesn't change how they look to the human eye, but makes the information on them modifiable in real time by departments of transportation? So this is actually a test done on the I-75 corridor in Michigan with that technology. We came up with something we called smart signs that actually embeds metadata. Your computer can see it in the car. You can't, you just see a stop sign. But the Department of Transportation can change what that sign says from you know, a sign saying the speed limit on the highway is 70 to now it's saying accident ahead, take nearest exit. And now your car can get that information and transfer it to you. We also were working on other areas specifically around keeping people safe, uh, inventing better safety vest designs that are more visible to humans and to machines so that your car can see if there's a construction worker crouching on the road, walking towards you, walking away from you, et cetera. And even if you don't notice them, it reacts. So since 3M makes the safety vests, we wanna make the safety vests better. So another major lesson that I learned was be ready to learn something new every day. When I left academia, I was the world expert in my teeny tiny specific area of dynamical systems. Since then, I've learned so many different areas of mathematics, among many things. So some of these areas may be very familiar to many of you. Some of them may be what you're doing your PhD on, what you teach courses on, and I've had to touch absolutely all of them from the ones I did my PhD on, like dynamical systems, the ones I took courses on and didn't think about again, like ergodic theory, and things that were brand new to me. Right now I'm working in the space of entity resolution. My previous project was on causal learning. But mathematical things are not the only ones that I'm worrying, working on. There are also a wide variety of fields, skills, and tools you need to utilize. So some of this comes from other areas of science. So I've had to play in computer vision and predictive analytics and outlier detection, all these different areas of computer science and machine learning that touch very closely on math. And then more broadly, areas of science like EIT and NMR spectroscopy, Looking at things like deformation and non-rigid registration, this went into those non-contact fingerprint scanners because, of course, your fingers compress when pressed against a glass plate in a contact fingerprint scanner, and they don't when held up in the air before a non-contact fingerprint scanner. How do we convert the scan we have from one mode into the other? Combinatorial material science, materials informatics, process engineering, additive manufacturing. For about two years, I was working on AI for manufacturing, and this brought in so many different areas of mathematics and statistics. With a company as big as 3M, they manufacture a huge wide variety of things, and they have a lot of different ways that that can be improved. So of course, they come to the scientists, the mathematicians to say, can you build something that helps me optimize my process, that tells me when my machinery is going to go down before it blows up and where it's going to go down. Because of course, when you're building plants and when you're producing hundreds of millions of dollars with a product a day, being down for an hour is millions lost. Being down for two days is tens of millions lost. So they need to know right away. And that's actually something that I worked on deployed in 2020 and is in use in three plants around the world right now. Now, those are all different kinds of science you do, but what are you actually doing on a daily basis? Well, for me, that sometimes really means pulling out a notebook and a pencil and actually writing math equations down. So I still get to do that, which is really fun. Sometimes it means reading journal articles and teaching myself another area of math, another area of computer science. But sometimes it means coding. The best advice I can give 
you if you have any interest in working in industry or working with industry is learn to code. It's absolutely critical. It's nice to be able to tell someone you proved something, but if they can't implement it in any way, it doesn't really help them. So I came in with MATLAB and that was very useful, but MATLAB charges quite a bit to industry, so they don't use it as heavily. Since then, I've taught myself Python and SQL and Arduino for setting up robotics tables, AWS and Microsoft Azure for working in the cloud, Spark for dealing with big data, R because it's really good language for data analysis. But there are also really important soft skills in this area as well. You need to have collaboration and communication, mental flexibility, real huge enthusiasm for science, and critically important, a willingness to admit ignorance. Say you don't know it, say it's hard. And why are they critical skills? Because you're not going to be working with mathematicians. That's life in academia, working with people in very close areas to you, but that is not life in industry. In industry, you work with other kinds of scientists from a huge array of different sciences, but you also work with different kinds of engineers, different kinds of analysts, sales reps, graphic designers, external customer experts, and these are truly people whose input is critical. The math may be perfect, but if People don't understand intuitively how to use the product. Can't sell the new version because they don't get why it's better. It doesn't help. So you need to be able to communicate well with all of these people. And you're going to be working on the problems that are most important to these people. So willingness to admit ignorance, to try something new, realize it's not working and say, I can't get this to function. Sometimes the answer is, Oh, I didn't even know you were trying that. I thought it was impossible. That happened to me. Uh, sometimes the result is, oh yeah, there's actually been a paper that was published last month in this other field that has just the solution for that. That also happened to me. When looking at industry, you end up with a set of very diverse problems and a really wide impact. So again, this is only my own personal experience, but these are all parts of the co my company that I've either worked on a project in or consulted on someone else's project impacting this division in the green. So every single business group we have, consumer, transportation, electronics, healthcare, and safety and industrial. I've worked with manufacturing, directly with sales and marketing, not to sell my product, but actually to use math to come up with a sales tool for them, our analytics lab and our process lab. I'm really running out of divisions to have an impact on at the company. I hope to eventually get those last four uh, under my belt, and then I can say I've really done everything at 3M at least once. So I want to share a lot of advice that I have for mathematicians in the job market. Some of it I showed during the talk, but some of it is very specific to if you are in interested in going into industry. Workshop your resume a lot over and over again. When I was here as a postdoc at the IMA, myself and four others who were grad students or postdocs in math, um, met for lunch once a week and we would go over each other's resumes and give advice. One of the things we realized was if we couldn't understand the description of someone's research, being another PhD mathematician, then for sure a physics um, PhD or an MBA was not going to understand that sentence. So getting someone to help you understand how to convert what you did to a language that any smart person can understand is very important. Another element of workshopping your resume is finding out what people find valuable that you didn't even think to include. In working on one of my research projects with a collaborator in Michigan, I had to write MATLAB code that would talk to her Fortran code. And heck, I had to get uh, understand how to debug Fortran, even though I never learned to write it itself. And this is called um, hybrid computing. It's very valuable in industry because they're frequently trying to get more recent programming languages to talk to legacy code. I had no idea it was important until I saw it on one of my mathematician friends' resumes and discovered this is something recruiters are looking for and was a, I was able to add it because I had been doing it. So learning what is valuable that 
didn't occur to you, but you genuinely have experience with is really helpful. Another really important piece of advice I have is to network, 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 and then keep on doing it. Come to the receptions, talk to lots and lots of people. In this day and age, uh, the internet helps us do so many things more easily, but sometimes that means that the competition for any one thing is immense. We've all seen that with trying to get tenure track positions. You're competing against 300 other people because it's so easy to apply for absolutely everything. It's the same in industry. You're competing against a lot of people. And worse, in industry, we usually use automated softwares to weed out people that don't seem relevant. We don't want someone with you know, no STEM experience to apply for a data scientist job. That'd be a waste of our time to read that resume. So software to weed you out. But the key to actually getting that interview, which is the key to getting the job, is to make sure a human being sees your resume and actually reads it. And that's why networking is so important. Being able to ping a real life human and say, by the way, I applied for this role. Could you take a look at my resume? Or by the way, I applied for this role in a completely other part of your organization. Can you make sure someone else takes a look at my resume? means that you'll get picked out of that pile, that you'll be looked at with more than just a cursory glance. It's no guarantee that you'll get the job, but it is a guarantee that you will get looked at and you can absolutely be missed in a giant stack of resumes without it. So use your career center at your university. That's what they're more useful for. Um, find alumni at places all over. Talk to your advisor, talk to your cohort, talk to your friends from undergrad, build that network out. LinkedIn is actually very useful. Prepare an elevator speech for all of your research. I did two REUs, I did my PhD research, I did different research in postdoc, and in my job interviews, there was never any indication of what people were going to pick out as the most interesting thing to them. I've literally been asked about every single kind of research I've ever done in the past, and you don't know what the people interviewing you are really going to like find most fascinating. Is it going to be inertial manifolds or global attractors, or is it going to be suspension bridge models that you haven't worked on for 15 years? So prepare an elevator speech, that 10, 15 second description that can be understood by any intelligent person for what you did. And if you don't know how to do it, grab another person and start practicing until they can understand it without a background in it. Here's something that's really important to understand. You're not usually hired in industry for your expertise. You're hired for your ability to develop expertise. It's very rare, especially among mathematicians, to be hired to do exactly what your PhD was on. But instead, they know you have a PhD in mathematics, you can truly look at almost any area of science and turn it into something you can teach yourself. That's why they love hiring mathematicians. That's why they want you, because you can do almost anything, because math is everything. That's why I love math. And so they want you to come in and be able to teach yourself. The mathematical mind is great for industry because math is everything, but the mathematical mindset so many of us have is really detrimental on the job market. We all get this attitude that I only really know what I did my PhD on. I only really know this one very small area of my field. Don't ask me about anything else. Don't, don't ask me to help with this other area. I, I only took a class in that. That's not the level of expertise people are looking to you for. They're looking to you for your key core understanding of math as a field. Your understanding of any math problem they might be facing as a physicist or chemist or sales rep is going to be much deeper, even for something you haven't ever thought about before, than someone without that math background. So don't let imposter syndrome get in the way. What you've been doing is incredibly impressive. You wouldn't be here if it wasn't. And just remind yourself of that when you're on the job market. Here's a really important one if you're looking at industry. Don't let the job title or preferred qualifications discourage you. 
I can only think of one place where I've applied to a job and the job title was mathematician, and that is the NSA. They make it very clear that they're hiring mathematicians. Everywhere else, you're a research scientist, you're a developer, you're a data scientist, you're a scientist, generic, no description. And the preferred qualifications is, in all honesty, a wish list. It's everything we wish we could put into one brain and find someone to pay money to give us that. If they can find 40% of the things on that preferred qualifications, they're ecstatic. So don't worry if you don't have one or two of the bullet points, don't let that stop you. And especially as women, it's been proven by sociologists that we look to ourselves to match a job application uh, description perfectly, when in reality, that's not what ex is expected. Don't wait until a job exists to go for it. The time between permission to hire being granted to a, a group or division and the posting being seen by lots of people is fairly long. Reach out to connections, do your networking, express your interest in going into industry, and people will reach out to you while they're still writing that job posting up. So thank you very much. and. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be very happy to answer. Thank you so much for that incredibly useful information and excellent talk. Um, do we have questions for our speaker? Um, this is just about the work itself, mm -hmm. but with the self-driving cars, are they really using like camera vision or are there other modalities of data that the cars can implement that we don't have to make them better? There's actually quite a bit more information than just vehicle vision. Uh, most cars have a wide suite of information uh, coming in like LiDAR sensors. Um, uh, I'm forgetting what it is, but uh, an additional sensor with uh, time of flight sensors that uh, see distance to objects, et cetera. And when working in that field, you're really working with all of the different sensors that are in existing vehicles, as well as frequently working with companies that are developing the next generation. One of the nice things about working at 3M was most people working in vehicle vision are trying to find algorithms that they to and to fit reality around us. At 3M, we make pavement markings, we make um, safety cones and safety vests, we make road signs and license plates. We are really all over the roads. So we can actually change the world to fit our algorithms. That's what we were doing with the smart signs is we were saying, you know what would be great if road signs actually told us way more than they do, so let's do that. Um, so many companies, uh, working in the field of automated and assisted driving there are two very different directions um, with between automated fully and assisted um, they're using a lot of advanced mathematics but they're also playing with a lot of different kinds of sensor suites and some of them are playing with companies like mine to change what is being sensed hi this is uh, Malie Hamid from University of Waterloo I just wanted to know when you say you know you're collaborating with people from all areas of research, how do you stop yourself from diving in too deep into that subject matter and pick out what's relevant for your task at hand? Mm -hmm. um, part of that is just experience getting the hang of it. Part of it is really paying attention to other people's cues. If their eyes glaze over, I've gone into too much detail. I usually, <laughs> uh, I usually personally try to start at a high level and ask if they would like more detail or would like to understand how that works. Sometimes people are looking for really just the high gloss, what can this math do? And sometimes they actually want to understand it in detail because they want to, interplay with what material properties they're developing they want to, to interplay with what sensors they're planning on putting in the final product etc so it's about gauging and asking the question no one minds being asked how much detail do you want me to go into in fact at my job interview for my role at 3m um, there was one mathematician already in the lab and so 
after all of the questions others had asked at higher levels, he actually asked me about fractional operators. And I said, does anyone mind if I answer this? It won't be understandable to non-mathematicians. And no one minded. They all kind of just listened and didn't try to understand for a bit while he and I talked about the really advanced mathematics that wasn't familiar to them. There's a question here and then one there. Oh, okay. And I guess one right there. Well, first of all, thank you so much for this excellent talk. And I think those great advices can also be applied uh, to academia. Mm -hmm. um, so I do have several questions. Uh, so the first one is, oh, since you mentioned so many projects, I'm wondering, like, do you propose those projects by yourself? Or you got those projects, you know, from other colleagues or your, um, you know, boss? Um, thank you very much. That's a very good question. It can really depend. Uh, we like to use the terms push projects and pull projects. Pull being when the customer the in, or the intermediary customer, like the division, the marketers, et cetera, comes to you and says, I need you to develop this technology for me. Push being where we come up with a cool idea and try to push it into the divisions. Hey, wouldn't it be great if we could do this? Could you sell that? In my own experience, I've really hit all those different um, uh, experiences. So if I go back a few slides to the actual projects. Uh, so none of the ones in the find other people doing math were started by me, but people approached me to help them with different parts of it as needed. For the um, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy project, that came when I went to an internal conference we have um, every year where work in development is shared with the rest of the technical community at the company. And I wandered around looking at poster titles and I saw the word diffusion in the title. Since I know diffusion from a mathematical point of view, I started talking to the chemical analyst who was presenting the poster. And almost everything he said went over my head until he said, we could get much better distributions if we could use inverse Laplace transforms, but none of us know how to do that. So I said, I taught those in grad school. Um, sometimes it's about finding that connection where you know something that they need. And uh, there are other projects where the division comes to us, like with the, um, the Filtreat Smart uh, one, or projects where some other group of colleagues developed it themselves like with the clear tray aligners project that was initiated by two of my friends and later when i wrapped up the filtry smart project and was looking for something new i approached them to see if there was a problem that was not near term but that they would really love to have solved that i could work on and try to go to this area I'd never worked with 3D computer vision. I'd never worked with computational geometry. I'd never worked with um, Python even. This is the project I taught myself Python on, but it looked interesting what they were doing. And I thought this could be a great direction. Let's find something new to do, but that isn't time critical for them. And that was how I entered my way into that project. I know that, well, through those years, you have accumulated so many new skills. So I'm, as a mathematician, I'm not afraid to learn new stuff, okay. but I felt like you also have to learn very fast. <laughs> Does that create you know, anxiety to you? Because for me, I felt like it is something that I cannot do. Um, I'm very familiar with the anxieties that math can uh, provide for us. In my case, one of the things I had to teach myself was that I did not have to become an expert. I did not have to understand it to the depth that I was expecting, that I was used to coming from a PhD and postdocs. I really only needed to understand enough to get started. My workplace is very collaborative and understanding enough to like take the next step and then discussing with others was sufficient to really get work done. Over time, you have the chance to really get that in-depth knowledge and become the expert, but you don't need it before you start. You just need enough to get to the very next step. And so not expecting myself to learn everything fast, just expecting myself to learn a little fast. 
one journal article and then try to run the code that they've made public. Um, one tutorial and then try to write some dummy code in that space for myself, et cetera. Karen Zacks with the American Mathematical Society. I direct federal relations and just to say where my question is coming from, but I love that last question. <laughs> that was great. Um, so this is particularly maybe applicable or relevant in the healthcare stuff you talked about mm -hmm. and the, the smart transportation applications. Do you guys have discussions about ethical implications like privacy, you know, privacy concern, concerns Absolutely. over these projects? And what does that look like at 3M? Um, so it can be very dependent on the project and the space that it's in. So right now I'm in our health information systems division. Um, we're working with a huge majority of the nation's healthcare data in our software. So privacy is absolutely critical. Everything we're working on, we're dealing with our lawyers, we're dealing with people whose job it is to ensure the ethics of our products and to ensure um, that we've thought out the potential consequences. Sometimes this means that we can develop a really great technology, but 3M won't put it on the market because of the potential ethical implications if used incorrectly. You know, it can be very frustrating when you come up with a really cool idea and you know it's possible, and then someone says, well, yeah, but if people did this with it, that would be very bad. But you realize you don't want to take that risk with a company with wide reach there's going to be that tiny percentage of people who misuse a product and misusing a sponge is much more safe than misusing something that affects people's health and lives. So um, frequently a lot of interactions with legal, a lot of interactions with uh, environmental health and safety regulatory within the company. Um, following all of the, the rules, no matter how frustrating they can be. Working in a digital space, I have to deal with a lot of IRB when it comes to teeth scans, when it comes to fingerprint data. And sometimes it's frustrating because the startups aren't following the rules. They're not getting IRB approval and they're just getting the data they need. But we can't do that. We're, we're big enough to you know, face consequences. So sometimes you have to wait six months before you're allowed to scan the fingerprints of your teammate because that is potentially identifiable data that will be on a work computer. So it's working with a lot of people whose full-time job it is to think about the consequences of this and attending talks about fairness and ethics in AI and keeping up to speed on the current knowledge in the field so that we're also trying to enact best practices even on a daily basis. So let's thank our speaker again. Thank <laughs> you.